Um, all right, so yes, I'm gonna be talking about this very broad topic of psychology, trauma, and social justice. And um, I thought that I would start off just saying a little bit about me and how I became interested in doing this work. Um, I am from Canada originally. I grew up in Canada. I was born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, right in the middle of Canada. And my parents immigrated to Winnipeg from Trinidad in 1961. And they had my two older brothers and me. The first, their first nine years in Canada were a whirlwind. My dad, they had the three of us. My dad um, went to university and medical school. And um, it, was, it was really just a great place to grow up because um, I loved having an upbringing where my brothers and I were really encouraged to be curious about things and to um, take whatever interest we had and just explore it to the utmost. And so I was um, nine years old when I became interested in psychology. And um, there was this really popular TV show at the time that I don't think any of you would have heard of but it was called the Bob Newhart show. And it was about, there was this comedian kind of like how Jerry Seinfeld had his own show as a comedian. It was kind of like, he was playing this character. The character in this was a psychotherapist and you kind of saw his day-to-day -day life, which was pretty interesting. So I became interested in psychology and I found out that you could be a psychologist and actually be a scientist because I'd always been interested in science. And so, um, you know, we tend to think of psychologists as, as people who treat people's problems, um, help people with mental health problems. But I'm the kind of psychologist who does the research side of it, the science side. So I, I'm a scientist, not a practitioner. And um, this kind of scientific lens really informs everything that I do professionally and kind of asking this question of how can we apply the tools of science to understand each other better and understand our world better. Um, and so after I um, graduated from high school in Winnipeg, I moved to um, Toronto in 1988 to do my undergraduate degree in psychology at the University of Toronto. And I loved it. I ended up doing all three of my degrees there, my Bachelor of Science, my Master of Science, and my PhD at University of Toronto. Um, and then after that, I did my postdoctoral fellowship, which was a cross-cultural study of depression in women. So I looked at um, women in three different countries. So I, um, not only Canada, but also um, I did part of my fellowship at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, interviewed women there about depression and part of it at the University of the West Indies, where I interviewed women in various parts of the English speaking Caribbean about depression as well. And then after finishing my postdoctoral fellowship, I um, took a faculty position in Department of Psychiatry at University of Toronto. Um, and I was known generally as, as a depression researcher. Uh, that was in the late 1990s and then I moved here to New York to become a professor at New York University 20 years ago and in moving here you're from a Canadian context to American context I, I start, start thinking a little bit differently about about mental health and depression I realize that you can't really be a researcher of depression without actually being a researcher of oppression and trauma and racism and discrimination and violence, because those are the things that make people depressed. And so, you know, rather than looking with a, a primarily a clinical lens at understanding depression, sort of from a medical model, I want to understand depression sort of in more experiential cultural way and understand what these factors are that give rise to the higher rates of depression in more socially vulnerable groups. So people who are um, marginalized, people who are oppressed, where we see these higher rates of depression. And so that's sort of the backdrop that informs all of the work that I do. So more broadly, the main questions that inform my research are, um, what are the mental health effects of these sorts of oppressive factors like poverty and trauma, violence, uh, racism, discrimination. 
And then a second question is, how can we develop and study treatments and interventions that address these effects, these mental health effects? So you'll see here, I put develop and study in italics. These are, these are two very different sorts of endeavors. We can develop treatments and interventions um, and deliver them and know anecdotally um, or from talking to patients or clients that, that they work. But it's very important to scientifically study, especially new and emerging treatments and interventions, because if we don't prove that they work, then um, we, we, we can spend a lot of uh, time and resources on things that we think are helping people that are actually not. So that's really important. So what I'm gonna do today is talk to you um, about two different projects, um, one which I have completed, the other which I'm still um, continuing and have been working on um, for a number of years now. And these are examples of projects that sort of capture the ways that I explore these different questions. All right, so this first example is in the topic area of poverty and depression. Now, just by way of the backdrop, one of the most consistently reported findings in the clinical literature and the epidemiological literature is that people who are living in poverty, who live you know, at or below the poverty line, are at an increased risk of experiencing depression compared to people who are well off or people who are um, middle class. And so one of the things that this made me wonder about is this question, can we look at a program that is designed to lift people out of poverty and see if a program like that can decrease rates of depression? And so that was the underlying question to this project. So I studied um, this program called the Project Enterprise Poverty Transition Program. Now, very importantly, this is a program that was not in any way designed to be a mental health program. It's not designed as a mental health intervention. It's basically a microcredit program for people who are poor, all right, so people who live at or below the poverty line. So this is a program that serves very low income clients. It is based here in New York. Um, almost all of their clients are uh, people of color. And this program uses a micro lending peer group model. So this is based on an international development model where um, there are a number of programs in very, very poor countries where community members, usually women actually, are given these very small loans to start either a business or some kind of community endeavor like um, building wells to have clean water. And this approach has been very, very successful in the realm of international development. And so what Project Enterprise did was they took this model and they applied it to working with very poor people here in the United States. So what they do in this program is people form uh, peer groups of about five to 12 people, and they go through training as a group to learn about how to build an entrepreneurial venture or a small business. They are then given um, a small microcredit loan, and they use that loan to build their business. And then as a group, if someone in your peer group is not able to pay back their loan um, for a time being, then collectively the other members of that group pool their money together to help that person pay back their loan. So it's a very interesting sort of fusion of a capitalist model that's, that's based on entrepreneurship and a more collectivist or socialist model of shared accountability, which has been very successful. In fact, with these clients who again are very, very poor clients, the average loan payback is over 90% um, every year, which is really, really very impressive because these are all people who would never qualify um, to get a business loan from a bank. So it's very impressive. And so what we did is we wanted to learn a little bit about the workings of this program. Now this program started um, actually under President Clinton's um, time in office. He had this business improvement district um, initiative where he created in low income parts of the country these targeted enterprise zones and Harlem was one of them. And so Project Enterprise started off in Harlem. It's actually one of the reasons why um, when President Clinton left 
office, his office that he set up post presidential term was actually based in Harlem because this was one of these enterprise zones that he um, actually helped to create. And so one of the things that goes on in these zones is that landmarks in the area and, and places that generate um, income and are important to the local communities were supported. You know, there was um, very famously um, a, a lot of construction and renovation of the Apollo Theater, which is actually directly across the street from where the project enterprise offices are. And so this was all part of that initiative. So we decided to look at this program and try to understand what kind of positive mental health effects this program can have on the people who go through the program. And so we collected data on depression from 73 participants who were taking part in Project Enterprise. And we collected data on them before they started the program. And then again, six months after they'd been in the program. And so these are all people who were very poor coming in um, and they had higher rates of depression than what is found in the general population. And we followed them and looked at what their depression rates were like after they'd been in this program for six months. And what we found is that at the completion of the study, over 40% of the clients who had scored at the level of clinical depression before taking part in the program were now no longer clinically depressed. So this is very significant because as some of you probably know, this recovery rate of about 40% is actually comparable to what we find when we look at outcome studies of psychotherapy and antidepressant medication. So in those studies, about 40% of people who go through um, psychotherapy, individual or group psychotherapy, or who take antidepressant medication show improvements. And so this was very interesting to find that this was not a mental health program, and yet we found a comparable rate of depression recovery and so more broadly, we can say that these findings show that we can actually treat depression by changing the material conditions of people's lives when we're looking at very poor people. So this was very significant to our research team because we like to find things that are alternatives to mainstream medical treatment. You know, a lot of people would agree that it's far better to um, engage in something where you're actually creating this ripple effect in your community of, of not yourself not being poor anymore, but creating a small business that is serving the community. And this ripple effect happen, happens not only within your life and in the life of your family in terms of you're your better off economically, but it helps the broader community. And you know, most people would agree that's much better than having to take a pill every day. And of course, you know, this would be a whole other lecture, but there are a lot of problematic adverse effects and side effects that go along with antidepressant medication. If we can get similar results by just helping people not be poor anymore, um, there are a lot of advantages to this kind of program. And so we were very encouraged and, and, and actually fascinated by, um, by these results. Um, so that's the first uh, study that I wanna talk about. The second study is um, looking at a very different um, marginalized and disadvantaged population. And this is military veterans. It's really interesting to me, um, when I moved here from Canada, I never would have thought that for several years, um, it's been now six, more than six years, my primary area of interest would be um, studying military veterans um, because it's not something that I had background knowledge in. However, I have studied treatments for trauma for well over 25 years. And what was fascinating to me when I started studying this particular program for veterans is that in all of the trauma programs that I've studied over these two and a half decades, I have never had outcome data that were as compelling as the outcome data that I had from looking at this and in terms of just the improvement in post-traumatic stress symptoms. So this is a very, very intriguing uh, program, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you all about this today. Um, so just again, by way of background, 
We know that the mental health needs of military veterans in the United States are dramatically underserved. So there, there are decades and decades of data and the numbers are, are not improving across most of these parameters. Veterans are at increased risk for a whole host of problems, um, addiction, alcoholism, homelessness, high rates of poverty, high rates of unemployment, and other factors that are, are related to persistent trauma. We also know that the number of veteran suicides is now well over 20 per day, some estimate 24 per day. So that means that over 20 veterans um, kill themselves in the United States each day. So for the first time now in history, the number of suicides among veterans exceeds the number of combat deaths. Um, and this is yet at a time when we claim that we have state-of-the-art mental health care available to veterans. And so there's something lacking here. It is definitely clear that we need mental health care that can do a better job of helping veterans and in particular supporting veterans when they come back from service and helping them um, more holistically and successfully reintegrate back into civilian life. And so that's what this program is about that I'm gonna to talk to you about now. So this program is called Decruit. It's a, a veterans trauma treatment program. It is called Decruit because um, it's sort of taking this idea that when someone decides to enlist in the military, they have a recruiter who reaches out to them, supports them, and kind of holds their hand through the entire process of enlisting and joining the military. However, when a military member's service time is over, there's not someone there or a group there that helps them to decruit or leave the military and successfully tra transition into civilian life. And so this is a program that is designed to help veterans um, in this process of transition and reintegration. So the program uses a concept called unit cohesion. And unit cohesion is actually a term that was coined by Sigmund Freud in 1921. Um, to describe the bonding and experience that members of a military unit who are working together form when they're working on a mission towards a common goal. So it's a, it's a sense of uh, bonding and cohesion that, that Freud is talking about here. So this is a group treatment program. So you can think of Decrude as almost being kind of similar to being modeled on group psychotherapy, really. And um, this program uses this idea of unit cohesion to reflect the bonds of military culture so that when veterans come to this program, even though they don't know each other, they all have this common bond of having um, served in the military. So they have the bond that, that veterans share. And also the fact that when they come to this group, because they're all veterans, they have a kind of camaraderie and a shared understanding that is really beneficial to um, the therapeutic effects of working together as a group. Um, so this program is based on the use of narration through theater and specifically through Shakespeare. This is why this program fascinated me so much, to find a program that produces such dramatic increases in people's um, levels of self-efficacy, which I found, and decreases in depression and decreases in post-traumatic stress, but it is not a medical treatment. It uses Shakespeare. is just utterly fascinating to me. So this, this is a program that was developed by a um, military veteran named Stefan Wolfert and is based on his own experience of trauma. So Stefan was um, a very high ranking, very, very successful um, military service member. He was serving in the US Army. And one day on a routine training mission, his best friend was shot in the head in front of him and he held him for three hours while he died. He held him and you know, the medic came and couldn't even get the IV in because the medic freaked out because Stefan's friend's head was like a hollowed out watermelon just sloshing around like he, it was, it was, it was a traumatic thing for Stefan. And in that moment, you know, when his, his, his friend died, he just snapped, something just broke. Um, 
he hopped on an Amtrak in, in the United States, just going across the country um, aimlessly, just him and his rucksack, not knowing where he was going. And he randomly hopped off in a tiny little town called Whitefish, Montana. And um, he was wandering around the town and he wandered into this little community theater. Now, Stefan had never seen or read Shakespeare in his life, but he wandered in. It turns out they were performing Shakespeare's play, Richard III. And he comes in, sits down in the back row, puts down his rucksack as the light, lights are dimming and the play begins and Richard limps onto the stage. He's a soldier and a veteran. And Richard III begins um, his monologue that begins, um, this is the winter of our discontents. And Richard's monologue and his story in this play is really about himself and his experience as a veteran. And in watching this play, Stefan found himself crying and heaving and sobbing. This is him on the stage. He had been a decorated, celebrated soldier, and now he was broken. He was one of those people who could snap into violence in, in one split second. People feared him. People vilified him, as they did Richard III. And he saw himself on the stage and understood his experience through Shakespeare. And after that, he left a career in the military and is now one of the top classically trained Shakespearean actors in the world. And Shakespeare literally saved his life. He was one of those um, suicidal homeless veterans that you would see on the corner. Um, and he um, is alive now, literally because of Shakespeare. So he started the Decruit program so that um, other veterans could um, learn um, from what he learned and hopefully themselves um, start to work through their trauma. So in, on, on many levels, the Decruit program is an example of what we call veteran informed practice. So this is a program that is developed and delivered by veterans for veterans. So we train military veterans to deliver this treatment program to other veterans who um, are experiencing the effects of trauma. So I'll tell you a little bit just about, this is our little schematic that shows the five stages of this treatment program, of the Decruit program. So the first stage is called formation. This is where the veterans come together in a group and they uh, practice and perform Shakespearean verse together. They immerse themselves in the world of Shakespeare. They learn that um, many of Shakespeare's um, plays, the comedies as well as the tragedies are full of veterans and family members of veterans. They also see in this powerful elevated language, the, the, the way that Shakespeare describes the suffering and the experience of trauma that these veterans experience. And they understand that there's a timelessness to their suffering that these veterans from, from Shakespeare's time centuries ago suffered very much in the same way that they are suffering now. Um, they also respond to the structure of Shakespeare's world. Um, those of you who have, have studied Shakespeare, you might be familiar with this idea of the um, Elizabethan great chain of being, which is very much um, a highly structured rigid hierarchy. And this is something that in many ways mimics the hierarchical structure of the military. And so the veterans understand that structure um, quite readily. And so they immerse themselves in that world and they study um, in particular the uh, Shakespearean monologue form. What they then do, and this is stage two in the pink here, they move on to this narration phase where they compose their own personal trauma monologues, which is a monologue that tells the story of the traumatic event that they've had that has affected them the most. And so what this does is by taking their experience of trauma and setting it down on paper, it creates a sort of external object of reflection where they can see their trauma there in words in front of them, it starts to kind of distance them a little bit from it in a way that allows them to reflect on it. And then following that in stage three, which is a stage that we call simulation, each of the veterans then hands off their personal trauma monologue to a fellow veteran in the group who will then 
memorize, practice, rehearse, and ultimately perform that monologue for the group. What this does is it creates something that we call an aesthetic distance, where here is that veteran's trauma, their story being performed in front of them. And maybe this is something that they cannot forgive themselves for. So maybe, you know, a comrade died in combat, and they blame themselves, or maybe innocent civilians died and they blame themselves. And that usually is a big source of trauma, that sort of guilt and self-blame. But by seeing a fellow veteran performing your trauma, you can start to understand, empathize, forgive them as the beginning of healing by forgiving yourself. So that aesthetic distance in, the, in this um, third phase of the treatment is very important. Then in phase four here in the green, this is a phase that we call routinization. In this phase, we teach the veterans to engage in the routines of classical actor training, which is grounding and breathing, the use of breath. This is very important because when we use these sorts of techniques, we're giving them something that is routinized, where we ask them to, at the same time every day, engage in these grounding techniques and practice the rehearsing their own trauma monologue. So actually speaking their monologue and also speaking uh, the monologue that they're gonna perform um, for the group of their fellow veterans um, trauma that, 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 that they've been assigned. And what's very interesting here is that the, the veterans really respond to this component because this routinized structure gives them a ritual or routine to follow. And so often veterans say that when they leave the military, they miss that experience of having a routinized structure to the day, which very much defines military life. The other thing that we find is that by engaging in this sort of breath work, they're better able to deliver the verse when they're performing their fellow veterans um, trauma monologue. So, you know, a lot of times people who study group therapy say in between, you know, group sessions, these clients, these patients are given homework to do, like, oh, do your breathing, do your, do your breath work or your grounding exercises. And half the time people don't bother doing that homework in between sessions, we, we know that. In this case, the veterans do it because what they found is that by doing that breath work, they're able to better perform their fellow veterans um, trauma monologue. And so they're better able to honor their fellow veterans trauma and their suffering by doing that. It makes them better at it. And so what happens then is we see an improvement in how the veterans actually feel in, a, in, a, in an embodied way physiologically. And so this is very important because by, by doing this breath work, they're not only engaging in a physiological um, regulation, which is so important for the processing of trauma. Remember, they're also at the same time practicing reciting Shakespeare's verse, which is based on an iambic pentameter, which you all know, to be or not to be, that is the question, all of that. And that's very important because it, it's actually a meter that was deliberately structured to reflect the human heartbeat. Da 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 da. Now in Shakespeare's time, the actors were, were, were mostly illiterate. And so what Shakespeare did is he used rhymes and rhythms and natural rhythm like this heartbeat rhythm to help the actors, the performers memorize their lines. So it's not a coincidence that the iambic pentameter actually mimics the human heartbeat. But in reciting these lines, there's actually a regulation that happens. And so we use something called heart rate variability, which is um, a correlate of trauma, the trauma response, as one of the things that we measure in the veterans who go through the decruit program. And we found significant improvement in terms of the regulation around heart rate variability. So that's, that's been fascinating. And a lot of it has to do with this um, recitation and grounding and breath work. Um, and then the final phase of the treatment is a phase that we call communalization. In this phase, we have an invited performance where uh, family members, um, fellow veterans, community members come and they are um, an audience for each of the veterans who went through the program performing their own personal trauma monologue and then a paired Shakespearean monologue that has been selected deliberately to reflect a similar sort of trauma to what they're um, speaking about in their monologue. 
what happens here is that it, we're, we're, we're using as sort of um, tying together all these different forms of healing. This is a more communalized way of doing healing because community members and family members are bearing witness to the veteran suffering. That's very important. And we also use it as a way of bridging the veteran civilian divide so that these, you know, that, that, you know, it humanizes the veterans to the people in their communities, which is very important. Um, so what we have found, um, I could go on and on and on, as you can tell, talking about the program and there, we have so much data that have just been really, really amazing and, and just so interesting. But just, you know, the short story here is that thus far we've, we've studied 30 veterans who have completed the program, as well as um, a randomized control group of 30 veterans who are simply controls, they've not gone through the program. And we have found that the veterans who completed the DECRUIT program showed significant decrease as I said, in PTSD and also symptoms of depression. And so that's pretty remarkable, again, with a non-medical uh, treatment, you know, no medication. Um, we're just treating trauma with, with Shakespeare, which is, which is to me just really remarkable and, and, and wonderful. Um, but, you know, just generally, what we can see here is that these kind of non-traditional mental health treatments can actually be highly effective. And it shows, as I was saying at the very beginning, that's really important for us to study these different unusual kinds of programs because that's how we allow them to um, expand and continue because we, they become evidence-based then. Um, and the other exciting thing about doing work on these kinds of programs is that um, they actually build upon existing strengths within communities. So, so the sort of the bond of camaraderie in uh, the, the veterans community, the, the very poor community members who come together in these peer groups and support each other's uh, entrepreneurial endeavors and project enterprise, for instance, they, these sorts of programs can em empower marginalized communities by basically making them stronger from within, as opposed to saying, you need to find things outside of your community that, 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 that's gonna fix you. You need, you need to take this medication, you need to use the, this other medical treatment. So that again has been one of the things that's been really exciting to me about um, studying these sorts of programs. Okay, so let me stop the share. This is, this is Stefan here. You have a little higher volume? Oh, let me try. Well, I believe what happened Can you hear it? What happened to all veterans in this country. We yeah, were good. treated as psychologically malleable age. Then we were wired for war. But at the end of our military service, we were not unwired from war. We were not rewired for society. And then, to making matters worse, we're severed, amputated from our community of comrades, our structure, our mission, our, our purpose, our support. Camaraderie is one of the main reasons a lot of us go into the military. Now we're offering not only camaraderie, but in a creative setting versus the military. And it's also expression, being able to express ourselves. Two other people read it. We're gonna keep, I just wanna make sure everyone at least gets to act at some point. It's representative language for my experience. So it provides a language that I, I lack myself to describe my experiences, my feelings, my thoughts. But it seems like there's more like passion and more meaning in these kind of words. You know, it's like, I don't know, it just seems like, almost like when you speak in Spanish, like it has more meaning. Ah, yes. My, my grandma yells at me in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> or a speech will turn, churn up stuff that they may have, didn't even know they had. Grief fills the room up of my absent child, lies in his bed, walks up and down with me. Who dares receive it of it? And as, as we shall make our griefs and clamor war upon his death. Uh, the vast majority have no acting experience, no experience with Shakespeare, and the majority have no desire to. False face must hide with the false heart doth know. And then because of the camaraderie, the room is safe, so when that stuff comes up, they realize, oh, it's okay, I'm not gonna die. And then always a reinforcement at the end. What did I learn today? What did I can carry through the week? I reinforce listening. It also brings closure to the, to the night because Sometimes it's light and fun, and some nights it's heavy and deep, and, and it can feel, we can feel really raw. So rather than send them out into New York City, we want to make sure that we're 
wrapping it up. Reinforce uh, doing more Shakespeare and doing more Shakespeare and doing more Shakespeare and doing more Shakespeare and doing more Shakespeare. And doing more Shakespeare. <laughs> I reinforce how uh, I've been here a long time, how important this is to me to get through the week. So I'm glad to be here and meet you people. And off you go. Have a great week, everyone. Great Thank time. you. For, uh,